hello and welcome to Footnotes the Cicerone podcast, a podcast to inspire you about outdoor travel and activities in the UK and across the world. I'm Hannah and I hope you enjoy this episode. So I'm here today with Gillian Price and she lives in Venice and she's our expert on Italy. She's written 23 books and 26 articles at the current count on subjects including the Dolomites, the Cinque Terre, Tuscany and the Italian lakes, an adamant promoter of public transport to minimise environmental impact. Gillian belongs to Mountain Wilderness and is an active member of the Venice branch of CAI, the Italian Alpine Club. As a quick disclaimer in this episode... We are talking about walking on Italy, which is a fairly big place. As I said before, gillian has got 23 books about Italy, mostly. So we're not going to cover the Dolomites at all. And we're not going to talk about pilgrim trails. We have got a live event coming up covering the Dolomites. And there is plenty of information about the Dolomites and pilgrim trails on the Cicerone website. But just for today, we're going to just be talking about Italy, excluding the Dolomites and Pilgrim Trails. So, hi Gillian. Hi Hannah, lovely to be here. Yes, lovely to have you here. So, tell us about walking in Italy. Goodness, where should I start? (laughs) This is the challenge, where do you start? Well, (laughs) so what what do you love about Italy? Because you're not Italian, but you have lived in Italy for a long time. I actually do have Italian citizenship now, I'm very proud to say. But one of the things I just love about this country is the food (laughs) Um, because it's so varied and so local and so seasonal. So it's very hard to say what's Italian food because it just depends where you are and you have to ask people what's on today, what's in season, what what are you growing? (laughs) There is a little bit of a running joke about uh, at Cicerone that you can tell a Gillian Price book because there is always lots of information and lots of photographs of the food (laughs) fantastic i'm very proud of that (laughs) it's i mean it's a very important part of of a walking holiday you need to know that you're fueling well yeah i mean if you're walking you get hungry you know it's very important so you have to reward (laughs) yourself you know you know i can one of my wonderful memories of the amalfi coast is sitting on the waterfront with a beautiful pastry which they call a lobster's tail. In Italian, that's Corda di Aragosta. I just have to tell you about it because it was just huge. It took me about 20 minutes to eat it. It was lovely flaky pastry and it just came out of the oven and it was filled with this soft, lemony, shanty cream. I mean, I'd already done my walk, so I did deserve it. (laughs) Yeah, it's a good job this isn't live. That would be really hard if we were talking about pastries and we didn't actually have any Right. I think we should just go through a couple of general topics. What's the range of walking like in Italy? Well, if you start from the north, of course, you've got the Alps. So you can be walking along glaciers and high alpine and mountains, valleys, scree slopes. And then as you start coming down to the edge of the Alps, you've got all the um, the lakes, which form, of course, at the foot of the Alps. Then you've got the plains and then lots of hilly areas. But it, Italy is actually remarkably mountainous all the way down because you've got the Apennines that run right down the, the backbone of the country. But then, of course, you've got coastlines either side. You've got some beautiful beaches, which you can a lot of which you can walk along. Um, and they're backed by beautiful wooden, woody reserves. And then as you keep going further down, you've got lots of lovely rocky coastline. You've got the Amalfi Coast, which is very dramatic. And then you move down. And of course, then you've got at the very end, but not the end, you've got Sicily, which is a world of its own. And there again, you've got a blooming great mountain. You've got a great (laughs) volcano on it as well. But that, that also produces lots of fertile land. So you've got lots of orchards, uh, wheat fields and um, a bit of everything. Lots of islands as well. Yeah, this, I mean, there's a lot of diversity, considering it's not a huge country. Remarkable, quite remarkable, yeah. As you go up and down, the, the languages change, the dialects change, and um, and the people are different too. Do you need to speak Italian? Look, to be honest, it's it's something that I encourage everybody to learn a bit of Italian. First of all, for respect for the people. 
Um, particularly if you're walking in um, out of the way areas, you just can't expect people to speak English. I mean, in in the big cities, yes, and the tourist centres, even on the Amalfi Coast, um, yes, and in Tuscany. But once you get to smaller places, I mean, a lot of people in Italy actually don't have Italian as their first language. They'll have a dialect as their first language. My mother-in-law actually didn't speak Italian. She only spoke Venetian. Um, she used to speak very slowly to me. Um, <laughs> so it's um, it's it also, if you learn a bit of the language too, it helps you get more out of your holiday, I think. But of course you can come and everybody makes an effort to sign language to you and they're ever so helpful. So it's not a huge problem, but it's it's a nice thing to do is learn a bit of language. Yeah, I completely agree. We we do always have a glossary at the back of the book with a few key phrases in it. So, you know, we're not talking learning really complex sentences, but just saying hi and hello and please and thank you and things like that. People do appreciate it. Absolutely. And things like, what's for dinner, please? <laughs> what's on the menu <laughs> <Yeah>. today? <laughs> Are there any delicious cakes? Exactly. Well, you just go and point at them. You don't have to ask that usually. Yeah. Some some things are universal. Absolutely. So talking about Sicily, have you hiked up Mount Etna? Yes, we were actually very lucky. It was some years ago now. We didn't get to the actual, the very, very top, which is 3,300 metres above sea level because you're not allowed to go up that far. But we were lucky because... There wasn't an eruption happening at the time, and we did manage to walk all across. It took us a whole day from the north to the south across tracks. But at the moment, because it's um, a lot's happening up there, it's there are eruptions all the time. You're not actually allowed to go that far up. There are lots of lower walks. I mean, Etna's just a world in itself. As I say, it goes from 3,300 metres down to the coast, and it's it's just remarkable. And And all the way down, you've got, Different. I mean, at the moment, there's still snow on the top, of course. And on the way down, it slopes. You you can see all the different effects of the eruptions and all the lava flows, how they've gone. Out. You could, sometimes you've got little islands with trees in them that didn't get knocked down. And then further down, you've got um, things like lava tunnels that you can actually walk into, which, which are actually quite old. Where the lava, uh, a lava flow be coming down, and then, of course, it would – it always – cools on the surface but underneath it keeps flowing and at one point when the flow stops the lava keeps flowing out and then the tunnel empties because the top's still hard you can actually visit visit some of those as well it's terribly exciting <laughs> there's just so much variety that almost sounds like a natural slide like you could start at the top and get a little a sack to sit on and just slide <laughs> all the way down <laughs> to the beach Right, right. And then, of course, around the around the base, of course, you've got masses of wonderful orchards because it's just so fertile. Obviously, it takes years and years for all the lava to break up and, and produce uh, fertile soil. But at the bottom, there are uh, pistachio orchards and, uh, and the um, oranges and the lemons from the Etna area are famous because they're so good. And there are lots of vineyards as well, which is good news. They produce a very good Shiraz red wine in Sicily. <laughs> it's all the key facts. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they also do almonds. and They make very good almond paste, which they obviously make biscuits out of as well. Oh, uh, of course, those little ones that you get with a coffee. Yep. So what's the accommodation like in Italy? bit of everything really I mean if you really must you probably can stay in four or five star hotels but probably not so much in walking areas in the Alps of course you've got the refuges where you've got shared dormitories um, and basic facilities you've also got bivouac huts and then moving down into the hills you've quite often got walkers hostels which are a bit like the French uh, gîte d'étape which are like refuges but they're a bit more comfortable because they've got more facilities and then also some monasteries all have accommodation as well. And then you've got small hotels and guest houses. But also now, particularly recently, the Italians have started opening up their houses more. And so you can often stay, you know, do a, like a homestay or a farm stay. That's relatively recent because I can remember when we first went to Sicily, you would never, ever stay. In. Everybody was very, very private about their houses and you would you would uh, never stay in there. But now lots of people are doing bed and breakfast, which is great. It's a much nicer way to meet people and to see a house as well. And, of course, you can camp if you want to, 
but not everywhere. You have to be very careful not, you know, not to be camping on people's land or. But again, there is there's a range of of all oh, sorts. Absolutely, fronting for for everyone's pockets. Yeah, and very cheap at yeah. times too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if you wanted a luxury walking holiday, there'd be something there. And if you want a cheaper place to camp and, and do a bit of hiking, there'd be something. Sure, sure. I've been to Rome, not walking particularly, but just for a, a city break. And I've been to Venice. And I remember going in the summer and it was really, really, really busy and full of tourists. So obviously these are, you know, huge tourist hotspots. Is there anywhere that you can go walking in Italy that is really remote? Well, in, in midsummer, I mean, um, the alpine parts of Italy are very, it's very easy to find quiet places. The Dolomites obviously are busier, but for example, if you go to the Stelvio National Park, which is about halfway across the Italian Alps, that's much, much quieter. And then also you've got uh, places like the Oster Valley, which is the Italian side of Mont Blanc. And there you've got the Gran Paradiso National Park, which is just stunning. You can't, you almost fall over the animals. There are so many of them. <laughs> and that that's um, obviously August is um, peak holiday time for everyone, but that does tend to be much, much quieter than other places. And, and particularly if you stay up in the high altitude huts, then... Um, there's always a limited number of people staying in the hut. So if you're first out in the morning, then you've just got everything to yourself. Um, so it is, it's very remote in that sense. Further down, the Apennines are quieter as well and more remote, I'd say. In fact, you nearly always need a tent if you want to um, make the most of it. Of course, you wouldn't really want to be doing walking at sea level in midsummer because it's just far too hot. Then again, in, in Sicily, there are places like, the, as well as Mount Etna, there are also the Nebrodi and the Madonia Mountains, which are amazingly high and amazingly remote. And, and they, you can go there in the summer too. As a thank you to our podcast listeners, we'll be offering a discount on all our Italy guidebooks if you use the code ITALY25 at the checkout at cicerone.co.uk. Cicerone has 38 books and 73 articles on Italy, including guidebooks to the Dolomites, Cinque Terre, Tuscany, Umbria, the Amalfi Coast, the Italian Lakes, Sicily, the Apennines and pilgrim trails through Italy. So I hope you enjoy exploring Italy for yourself. Go on then, Gillian. What's the food like in Italy? <laughs> <laughs> well, as I mentioned, it is very region specific. What happens is if you're going to eat properly, you have to start with the antipasto, which means before the main part of the meal. And for example, if you're in Tuscany, you just have to have things like bruschetta, which are little toasted morsels, and they may have things like truffles on them or local pate on them. But then you have to move on to the pasta because, I mean, pasta is the essence of Italy, and there are just hundreds and hundreds of different sorts of of pasta. But for example, if you're in Tuscany, you might go for papadella, which are like thick ribbon pasta. They may be served with a sauce made from the wild boar, which is extremely tasty. Whereas then if you move over into the Marche area where the Apennines are, you'll get one of my favorite pastas, which are called tortelli. They're like little parcels, a bit like ravioli. And they usually have potato in them, which you might think, oh, how boring you know, pasta with potato, but they're incredibly luscious, very, very simple and incredibly tasty. That sounds a lot more vegetarian than a wild boar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the Italians are also very, very good on their vegetables. And you often see people out in the woods looking, foraging and gathering all sorts of um, wild vegetables. For example, in the hills just outside Venice, people often, they'll start going out soon, actually, and just picking the very tips of the wild asparagus, and then they'll make risotto with them. People get very excited about things like that. And then down, if you're walking down on the Amalfi Coast, you just have to have the mozzarella, the soft cheese made from buffalo milk. It's just, you just have to have it there because if you eat it anywhere else, it won't be the same because it's traveled. It has to be local. And there, of course, they, they do that wonderful salad that they invented on the island of Capri. It's called Insalata Caprese, which is very simply slices of good, soft, fresh mozzarella cheese with slices of fresh tomato and basil. So it's green, white and red, the colours of the Italian flag. How about that? 
but that is absolutely delicious if it's good quality exactly. cheese and tomato and basil it's just... exactly yeah you can only eat that in the summer when the tomatoes are in season you have everything has its season and then of course if you're in if you're in Liguria where the Cinque Terre are there that's the basil capital of Italy they put basil in everything and they make that wonderful sauce called pesto which is um I'm sure everybody knows it with uh, basil and pine nuts and oil and a bit of pecorino sheep cheese or whatever you've got and that's a classic but there again it has to be seasonal oh in Sicily uh, Sicily is probably to be honest probably the best place for food in Italy it's just so incredibly varied because they had lots and lots of Arab influences they think actually it might have been the Arabs who brought pasta to Italy in the first place could be and then you can one of the local dishes at Trapani which is where the uh, you you head off to the islands is couscous, couscous with fish, um, which was obviously bought, came up from South, uh, North Africa too. And then, of course, in Sicily, you've got the wonderful fresh fruit granitas, those shaved ice um, drinks, because it's so hot sometimes that you can't even eat, eat gelato ice cream. So you, you have this um, shaved ice, which is just delicious with, you know, fresh fruit juices and things. Okay, so out of all the places in Italy, where would you say is the best place for beginners to go walking? Right then, well, about five at least. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, the um, yeah, some of the Italian lakes would be a, a very good place to start because you've got fairly flat walking, not necessarily because the lakes are actually formed uh, at the foothills of the Alps, so they've got quite steep cliff edges as well. So it's not necessarily strolling. But um, if you've got Lake Maggiore, Como, Garda and Iseo. And the beauty of them is that they've got lots of ferries. So if you get tired, you just jump on a ferry. That's very handy. Lake Iseo in particular, which is the furthest one, the closest one to Venice, as it were, is pretty quiet. That's a good place to go. Brilliant. Anywhere else? Probably the probably Tuscany as well, because there you've got lots of easy walks and also in Tuscany you've got um, well as in everywhere all over Europe you've got lots of history and in Tuscany you can actually find places where you're actually walking along old Etruscan ways and the Etruscans were the people who were there before the Romans and they excavated lots of sunken ways and, and a lot of them are still there so you find yourself wandering along in the middle of the countryside uh, along this lovely road that's been there for centuries and centuries. <laughs> and lots of other people have walked along it before you too. That's the other thing that I like to remember, that I'm not the first one to, to have walked along a, way, a path. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, Tuscany's got lots of good places too, and you can be walking through, obviously, vineyards and linking up little villages with beautiful cathedrals and old monasteries and places like that. Tuscany has also got some, a very, very nice coastline. It's got a national park called the Maremma, which is, which is great, which means that the road does not run along the coast where the park is. So you actually have to park at, get the bus or the train, and, and, and then a, a little shuttle bus takes you in, which is great. So it's really quiet. And you're not allowed to stay, no one's allowed to stay overnight. So that's a very good place. And the walking's, the walking's very straightforward. You've got beach walks and, and then you walk through the woods as well. That's a great area, the Maremma in Tuscany. Brilliant. What about the best place in Italy to go for more challenging walking? Ooh. That's not the Dolomites. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. The Gran Paradiso, the, the big national park over on the Italian side of Mont Blanc's got some challenging stuff as well, if you want to. There, um, there's the Alta Via 2 there which crosses, it, sometimes you have to climb about 1,500 metres up and down a day. <laughs> that can be pretty challenging. Not outrageously difficult, but you have to be fit and have a bit of experience on uh, un unstable terrain as well. I've been um, ice climbing in Grand Paradiso. Wow, I'm impressed. I <laughs> <Yeah>. haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it, feel, it was such a long time ago that it... It feels like I'm almost making it up, but I know I definitely, when I worked for an outdoor shop, we got a sponsored trip 
And I think the idea was that we'd learn loads about the brands and we'd go home and, and sell loads more kit by these particular brands, which we probably did, but it was fabulous. It was back in the good old days of people having money to spend on uh, this sort of thing. So, yeah, we had, a, we had an amazing time. Oh, I'm, impre- I'm very impressed. <laughs> yeah, it was a long time ago. <laughs> Tom, there are things like that are on my list for my next life. I haven't had enough time so far. <laughs> oh, nothing stops you, Gillian. You can still do it in this life, I'm sure. Actually, the other good thing about the Grand Paladis is that there are quite a lot of um, peaks that walkers can get, well, walkers like me who don't climb can get to as well. And I really appreciate things like that. I can distinctly remember going up a peak one day from the Italian side and some French uh, climbers had come up from the other side and they, of course, had all their ice gear and their ropes and their crampons and everything. And they were really put out to see these pathetic Italian walkers, you know, wandering up the other side. <laughs> but um, but peaks, peaks are important because they give you a goal and um, and then you get, or you always get a fantastic view and they're a good place to have picnic lunch as well. Fabulous. So, one thing that you are really keen on is using public transport as much as possible. So I'm assuming that that means that the public transport in Italy is quite good. Well, I mean, I think it's fantastic. The fact is that it's it's public, which means that it's subsidised, so it's very, very cheap. And also it goes everywhere. I mean, just about every village has a school bus or a bus for, you know, to take local people to the to the nearest railway station or big place. So... The other thing is it's fantastic if you're doing a trek because then you don't have to worry about getting back to where you left your car. You just keep going. And then when you've had enough, you just bail out and get a bus or a train to wherever you want to go. And the other thing is public transport here means ferries, trains, buses, sometimes even cable cars. Some of the cable cars in the Alps are uh, public transport as well if they serve a village. Definitely on, I remember catching a cable car, a couple of cable cars on Lake Como they just cost a couple of euros as though they were a, a local bus because people were using them to get back home. So that's fantastic too. What commute. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, we get ferries here, but <laughs> a cable car is a bit more impressive, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I've got a couple of areas that I want you to say your favourite thing about them. So the Cinque Terre. The drama, the steepness. Who cares about it? wretched knees and, the, and the, <laughs> the incredible flights of steps? They're just, they're almost vertical. Just unbelievable. The Amalfi Coast. Uh, the cakes. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, also the bays. No, no, I take it back. I had some wonderful <laughs> swims there. There's some fantastic bays that you get to. The Italian lakes. Could be the cable cars. And the, a couple of islands too. And the fact that they're, they're just so dramatic. Because um, a lot of them are formed where there used to be a glacier. So they've got amazing cliffs. I mean, a lake's a lake. A lake's are always wonderful. But they're just so dramatic. There are islands inside the lakes. Yes, a couple of them have got islands on them too. In fact, one of them, on there's one island on this tiny lake, Iseo. It's actually the highest altitude lake island in the whole of Europe. How about that? <laughs> that, is a, that is a fantastic fact. Exactly. You have to remember that for a quiz. <laughs> Abruzzo? The crests and the, the low cloud. because it just That's how it was when we went there, and it was just beautiful. We were walking on a little crest, and there were just clouds below us. We couldn't see anything else, and that was fantastic. Tuscany? Probably the Maremma, the um, coast that I mentioned before. Um, no, 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 the Etruscan, the Etruscan ways, the sunken uh, ways. And the, and the layers of history there as well. You had prehistoric people and then the Etruscans and then the Romans and then all the medieval places and then all the Renaissance. Yeah, the history there. Finally, is there anywhere in Italy that's a secret favourite that we haven't mentioned? You think I'd tell you? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, actually, actually, one of my favourite places are the Sibyllini Mountains. Um, they're on the Apennines, about halfway down Italy, let's say, absolutely beautiful. They were affected pretty badly by the earthquake quite a few years ago now, but the villages are getting back on their feet again. And there's some beautiful walking there. 
And a really magical place there is a huge, huge area called the Piano Grande. It's fairly high, middle altitude, but it, it used to be a lake, but it's massive. It's a huge plain now. It's completely flat and they grow um, cereals there. And in the springtime, you have this amazing sea of color of wildflowers and, and poppies and cornflower and all sorts of other things. It's just spectacular. That's probably... Uh, it's not a great secret. I didn't invent it or or anything <laughs> like that. Oh, but it's it's a very special place, and that's not far from the town of Norcha, which is also very special, which is also getting back on its feet again now. They're reconstructing pretty well. We have got a guidebook to the Sibilini, so it's not that secret. I mean, it's not an international bestseller either. So there's, you know, <laughs> it's also in. I think. Oh yeah, I've got Norcia too in my. There are, I've got also some walks in the Sibilini my, in my Umbria um, book. So I, I realised that was incredibly whistle stop tour of <laughs> all of Italy. Like, it was a a big ask. I think it's really important to just have a general introduction for people that are considering walking in Italy and they don't know what the options are. So that's why I was hoping to sort of do a really big overview of everything. But as I said before, you have written lots of articles and we have got sample routes from all the books on our website. And if anyone wants more information, if they go to cicerone.co.uk forward slash Italy, you can see we've got 38 books and 73 articles about Italy. Um, so there is <laughs> there's plenty more to to whet your appetite if Gillian hasn't done that um, for you. But yeah. Any final thoughts, Gillian? Go out and buy some boots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but there's just so much. I mean, there's still, I've got a bulging folder of places that we still haven't been to walk in Italy. There's just uh, so many more places uh, are coming up and um, opening up to walking too, which is good because you do need accommodation and, and preferably signed, um, signed uh, walkways as well. So, no, oh, no. Watch this space. There'll be more coming. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Gillian. That was that was really good. It's a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed the latest episode of Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast. I'd love to know what you think or if there's anything you'd like us to cover in future episodes. Please email live at cicerone.co.uk or leave a review on your podcast platform. You can follow or subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss new episodes or you can sign up to our newsletter for all our latest news, events and guidebooks. Visit cicerone.co.uk for further details. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, come and find us on our social channels. We're on all the main ones as at Cicerone Press, and we also have a Facebook group, Cicerone Connect, where you can meet and chat to other outdoor enthusiasts. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you soon.